If you remember exploding banthers, trying to make it through this impossible vent, and disco dancing Vader, then you grew up playing Star Wars Rogue Squadron. But which one? Because there were three games released in the series, and in this video we're going to compare each of them. Now, there have been a lot of Star Wars flight games over the years. In fact, the very first Star Wars game had you piloting a snowspeeder. At least I think that's a snowspeeder. In the 90s, LucasArts brought the flight combat experience to PC with the X-Wing and TIE Fighter games. But around that time, they had also struck a three-game exclusive deal with Nintendo. And after seeing the snow speeder level from Shadows of the Empire, LucasArts and developer Factor 5 got the idea to do an entire game based around that concept. Which is how we ended up with 1998's Rogue Squadron released for the Nintendo 64 and funny enough PC. Now Factor 5 were keen on recreating famous movie battles, however for some strange reason at that time LucasArts didn't like video games drawing directly from the movies. So this game's main campaign is said during the time of the original trilogy, but in the expanded universe. The story starts a few months after the Battle of Yavin, and we begin with a nice tutorial level on Tatooine. Oh, I see what you're doing, Factor 5. Just because we can't recreate scenes from the movie doesn't mean we can't revisit the locations. They're attacking the Oh no, they're attacking the homestead. I wonder if anyone's bothered to clean up Uncle Owen and Aunt Beru. Now, the flight controls do feel a bit limited compared to modern games with two analog sticks, but the starfighters still feel really responsive and fun to play in. And it's quite amazing the vehicle details they managed to get 25 years ago. This game also had a bunch of different camera modes from standard to cockpit to cinematic free camera. Hello citizens of Moss Eisley, the Rebel Alliance are here to protect you. Ah! Whoops. And just look at all the little details in this level. You can tell this was a labor of love for Factor 5. We've got the sand crawler, the banthers which blow up, Jabba's palace and the pre-special edition Sarlacc pit back when it used to look like a giant arm hole in the sand. Now, the developers couldn't just keep reusing the original movie environment, so the first proper level takes place on this Mayan temple planet. This game did a great job of expanding the Star Wars universe. Yes, the planets are a bit basic when compared to today's graphics, but they're still very much on brand. We've got the city on Corellia, the Imperial Construction Yards, the canyons of Gerard V, the prisons of Kessel, and the green hills of Chandrilla. Yes, a few of the missions do take um, inspiration from the movies, like the Snow Planet Fest, where you fly a snow speeder and harpoon 8080s, which I always found really difficult in this game. Or how about the planet Toleran, which is orange and covered in clouds with a bunch of floating platforms. But come on, they were just trying to give the people what they really wanted. Also, for some reason, the NPC crafts in this game have this weird kind of wobble that make them look like they're on strings. Gameplay-wise, the missions usually revolve around you escorting a slow transport, destroying some kind of big target, or just taking out the bad guys. Now, the draw distance in some of these levels can be a bit rough. And if you were playing this game on Nintendo 64 without the expansion, pack, then the game ran at the true potato resolution of 240p. But this was one of the few Nintendo 64 games to have a full voiceover, and the coveted John Williams soundtrack which really went a long way in making you feel like you were playing in the galaxy far far away. That, and they really got their money's worth out of the voice actors of all the screaming they had them do. I'm clear but my fighter is- ah! Now, as you play through the game, you unlock all of your expected Alliance Starfighters. However, the game ends with an unexpected surprise. The final level actually takes place during the Dark Empire story, which takes place five years after Return of the Jedi. Not only do you get to fly the V-Wings, but you have to stop the Empire's world devastators before they destroy Mon Calamari. And that's it for the campaign. However, this game was packed with great bonus features, like the N1 fighter, which was actually hidden deep inside the code as the game came out out six months before episode one. The bonus content also extends to extra levels which are actually said during the movies. I guess LucasArts never cared to put in the passcode. We get Luke's race across Beggar's Canyon, the Death Star Trench Run, and the infamous Hoth battle which started it all. Rogue Squadron would go on to sell over two million copies on the Nintendo 64 alone, outperforming both the developers and publishers' expectations. It was followed by the episode one-centric battle for Naboo, which was also a really good game. However, 
Nintendo had begun work on the successor to the N64 and wanted a Star Wars launch title. And so in November of 2001, LucasArts released Rogue Squadron 2 Rogue Leader. And just like the original, this game starts with a tutorial mission on Tatooine. And this seems to have been a conscious decision to show off the graphics bump compared to the first game. We've got better textures, better lighting, better particle effects, Mos Eisley is way more detailed, as are the Banthers, which still blow up. The ship selection still takes place inside the hangar, but you can actually control Luke this time. At this point, LucasArts seems to have also done a U-turn on their no movie scenes in video games, as evident by the nine episode one tie-in games they released. This meant that Factor 5 could finally play in the full Star Wars sandbox. And so the first proper mission in Rogue Leader is the attack on the Death Star, where the developers made sure to recreate every detail from the movie. In fact, Rogue Squadron was one of the main titles Nintendo used to show off the GameCube's graphics during its launch. The gameplay has also been tweaked, the starfighters are a bit more responsive and better balanced. You can now also give commands to your wingman via the d-pad and switch crafts midway through certain missions. We get this nice expanded universe level in the nebula and then it's straight to the Battle of Hoth, which is another overhaul from the original. Again, it feels like Factor 5 were truly set free this time around. No more hiding, we've got walkers, ion cannons, pretty snow effects, look the foot soldiers are in 3D now and they all run like my granddad. The harpoon bit is a lot more fun to do this time around and feels way more responsive, although the rope doesn't exactly look very tight around the AT-AT's legs, just looks like he got drunk and fell over. This is followed by a Y-Wing level in an asteroid field and then a space battle with a B-Wing which is a new addition to this game. There is so much more chaos on screen in levels like this which would have been impossible to do on Nintendo 64 even with an expansion pack. Factor 5 were also able to make more detailed environments like this beach planet with a crashed Star Destroyer. Look, we've got dynamic lighting, cool reflections in the water, palm trees, granted there's only about a dozen of them, but still. The developers also tried to make the expanded universe missions tie into the main plot, like this one where you have to steal the shuttle Tiderium from the Imperial Academy. I'm gonna make it, I'm gonna make it! How the hell will Luke, Han and Leia will have to sneak onto Endor in this flying Buick instead? And of course, this time we get a proper Bespin level which was always a standout for me. Look, they actually recreated the entire top section of the city. The final two missions take place during the Battle of Endor and are both meticulously crafted to give you that Return of the Jedi experience. We start with the space battle and then move on to the Death Star section. And oh god, this Falcon Escort bit made me rage quit so many times. The trench run is also a pain in the ass because it really sets every time you crash. Same thing on the way back after you blow up the generator. Damn it Lando, you're too slow, get out of the way! And so that's it for the campaign, but this being a Factor 5 game, it's filled with bonuses like galleries, bonus ships, and an entire documentary. There are of course a bunch of bonus missions like this alternate reality one where Vader takes out the Rogue Squadron before they blow up the Death Star. And then a second one where he goes after the remaining rebels as they flee Yavin. Look, you can even walk around as Vader in the selection hangar. What's he wearing? A Moomoo, Rogue Leader would go on to be one of the best GameCube launch titles and the best selling third party launch title. And so it was only natural that two years later we'd get another sequel, Rogue Squadron 3 Rebel Strike. Now Factor 5 found themselves in a bit of a pickle this time around. They'd already covered all the major space battles from the original trilogy and this game was still running on the same hardware as the last, so there was little more they could do with the graphics and that's when they decided to add on foot missions. Baro, this damn kid's rolling around in the courtyard again! Oh cool, I can ride the land speeder! Ah oh, crap. In addition to on foot sections, Rebel Strike also adds land vehicles, mainly the ATSTs, which has an interesting control scheme. The right analog stick moves both the cannons and the direction you walk in. Also, for some reason, they keep squeezing their legs together like they're bursting for a pee. Plus, the Banthers don't blow up anymore. The campaign begins right after the destruction of the first Death Star, with the Empire getting its revenge by attacking the Rebel base on Yavin. This is similar to the bonus level from the second game, but with a new coat of paint. After shooting down a few dropships, Luke and Wedge go inside the base on foot to rescue General Dodonna. And once again, Factor 5's love for all things original trilogy is clear with these on foot sections, which mainly act as a walkthrough of your favorite sets from the movie. And I do love how Luke handles his blaster in this one, just from the hip casually mowing down enemies. Make my day, Stormtrooper. After making their escape, the campaign splits into two, Luke's story and Wedge's story. Let's start with the former. We get this mission on Dantooine riding a speeder. Oh yeah, Jedi reflexes baby 
Now, why didn't we get scenes of Luke mowing down stormtroopers with a Gatling gun at point blank range in the movies? The story is also intercut with these scenes of Vader and Plasticine Palpatine chit chatting. We get two missions on this green haze planet first piloting a speeder and then a walker mission, and the rest of Luke's missions tie into the movies. We start with Hoth, but we can't just keep spamming the same Hoth mission three times in a row, so this time Luke has to raise the walker to the finish line. And look, he's doing pretty well. What you actually have to do is zip up, then cut the walker's gut open, and then chuck a grenade inside. Luke then gets on a tauntaun and dead eyes a bunch of stormtroopers before getting in an X-Wing and zapping a few TIE fighters. It doesn't quite reach the heights of the second game, but at least they try something new. This is followed by the Dagobah platforming section where we learn that Luke can't swim. I mean, it makes sense, he comes from a sand planet. Yoda then gives Luke some iconic lines of dialogue from the movie. Press the B button and call on the Force. Press the B button rapidly. And the level ends with him failing to raise the X-Wing. <sighs> That's what she said. The final Luke level takes place on the sail barge and it's really simple, you just have to jump from one barge to another and then you're done. As for Wedge, his level starts with a straightforward starfighter level outside this imperial prison. However, things get interesting when Wedge is sent to Geonosis, he gets into a dogfight in the asteroid field and then crash lands on the planet itself. And the next thing you know, he's gunning down battle droids and clone dropships before getting into a Jedi starfighter and going back up into the asteroid field to finish off the Fight. Plus, this Delta also has seismic charge grenades for some reason. Talk about a movie tie-in, but it does kind of make sense. This game came out in 2003, so Attack of the Clones was still the hot new Star Wars film. The rest of the Wedge missions are also pretty fun. You get this one going through the tunnel, then this one where he infiltrates this huge Imperial facility with a single walker, then steals an AT-80 and uses it to blow up the facility. Wedge's final mission has him use another bit of stolen Imperial kit, this time the TIE prototype. First, you've got to infiltrate the Super Star Destroyer, which is under construction, and then blow it up. Up. Both Luke and Wedge's plotlines come together in a speeder chase on Endor where you get to ram the scout troopers. The game ends with a campaign covering the Battle of Endor on the ground. We start with Chewie in the walker and then Han in the bunker, who's got that mum's just called you down for dinner energy when he's running down the stairs. Han blows up the bunker and that's it for the campaign, but of course this wouldn't be a Rogue Squadron game without bonus missions. And the developers really leaned into the on-foot gameplay for these ones. For example, they recreated the entire Death's star sequence from A New Hope. Nothing to see here, just a hopping stormtrooper. Um, Chewie, are you gonna do anything? I'm Luke Skywalker, I'm here to- oh, no, never mind. Alright, let's hop out of this place. Plus, both the Hoth and Bespin escapes also get the same treatment. Oh cool, it's Vader! Let me at him! Oh, damn it, blocked off by giant sugar cubes. Look at Leia, she's getting shot by stormtroopers, but her head is still in the clouds. City. But I think the most morbid mission is this one covering the battle over Endor. It starts off pretty standard. You take out a few Star Destroyers, then before you know it, you're flying through the trenches of Vader's Super Star Destroyer and shooting at the command tower. And that's when you realize you're actually playing as the unintentional kamikaze A-Wing pilots. In addition to the bonus levels, you also get more documentaries, more special vehicles, old arcade games that you can enter through the, um, disco. Plus, the entire second game is now playable in color op split screen. And so there we have it, the Rogue Squadron Trilogy. I think most people would agree that this series peaked with the second entry. The first game was limited by both the hardware and the lack of movie missions, while the third game's on-foot missions did feel a bit clunky and took away from the actual Rogue Squadron experience. Nevertheless, I still think the Rogue Squadron Trilogy are some of the best Star Wars games around. Unfortunately, they didn't get as much exposure as many of their contemporaries because they were, for the most part, Nintendo exclusives. A trilogy compilation for the Wii was actually completed and ready to be released, but was cancelled last minute due to financial reasons. Which is a real shame because I think these games deserve to be played by more people. But that's just my take. Please let me know your thoughts on the Rogue Squadron trilogy in the comments. Where do you rank them amongst other Star Wars flight games? And which of the three is your favourite? As always, thanks for watching. Please consider supporting me on Patreon and a big thanks to all my existing patrons. Also, if you've enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe and and hit the bell. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.